await the arrival of a great light, a divine light, into our world and into our lives. And that light comes in the person of a small child born in a stable. Birth always brings joy to those who have awaited for the arrival of that child. But the birth of Jesus brought, as we sing every Christmas, joy to the world, to the whole world. For unto us a Savior is born. So let us rejoice. You're sitting here like a bunch of Love well, Presbyterians. Come on now, rejoice a little. As Kathleen said to me the other day, with all that's going on, we really need a little joy right now. The biblical idea of joy, though, isn't, isn't just happiness. Joy is awareness of the presence of God. That's what the Bible means by joy. You can be joyful even if you are bearing heavy burdens, if you are suffering, if in the midst of your suffering you are aware of the presence of God, that you know that God is there at your side, bearing your burden with you. Since that is true, how great must our joy be when we celebrate the birth of God's Son. But how often are the gifts that we give expressions of that joy? Now, I know this is Advent. It's not Christmas yet. But I want to say a few words about Christmas gifts. Now, how do most people celebrate Advent? Well, Advent is a time of waiting for the coming of the Christ. The time that we wait for Christmas when we're going to celebrate the birth of Jesus. And how do we celebrate it? It seems to me that most of us celebrate Advent by running around buying Christmas presents or, in these days, trying to figure out what those reviews on Amazon mean. Uh, how did we get to this point? You know, the, the giving of gifts goes back to ancient Roman times. Uh, they, they would give gifts around the, the, the winter solstice. And when Christianity became the dominant religion of the empire, we Christians adopted that tradition. Uh, but the, the earlier Christians, they, they gave gifts either uh, shortly after New Year's at the, the Feast of Kings or early in Advent on St. Nicholas Day. That changed, at, it, it took a while, it only changed in the 19th century. And it did so because of the, the success of the night before Christmas and of Dickens' Christmas Carol. Now back in medieval times, Rulers felt that this gift-giving thing meant that the people should give gifts to the, to the rulers. And so they would often demand greater tributes or, or increase the tithes right around Advent and Christmas, which seems kind of a corruption of the whole idea of Advent joy. Uh, but how does it compare to, to, to uh, today? How many gifts are given for display, for conspicuous consumption, or out of obligation, or because we feel we're expected to give a gift, uh, or even out of competition? You know, they gave me this great gift last year. I've got it. I can I really afford to, to one up that? I mean, I, what am I going to give them? Is that is that any way to celebrate? And, and what kind of energy are you packaging in with that gift? What happened to the sheer joy of giving a gift in celebration of the birth 
of the Messiah. Can't we lose our peace and our joy in the holiday crowds? I think we often do. Is that any way to celebrate Advent? Compare the, the harried Christmas season as we celebrate it today with the charismatic proclamation in today's reading from Isaiah. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. Isaiah is passionately caught up in his awareness of the presence of God. And how could he not be? Look at the task that God has given Isaiah to do. He has sent me to bring good news to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and release to the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. That is the time to come, the time, the day of redemption and deliverance. And do we not today have all those people that were there in Isaiah's day, the oppressed, the poor, the brokenhearted, the prisoners. But in our time, in this time of Advent, are we bringing to them the good news? Imagine the joy with which slaves must have greeted Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation. Or think of those who were liberated from Hitler's death camps. That is the kind of joy that we might have today if all the people in this land were truly equal, if all barriers were gone, if all lies were not believed and truth prevailed. If like Isaiah in every moment we recognize our need for the mercy of God and how we are touched by the grace of God in every moment of our lives. Won't you spend some time this Advent with this recognition of the love of God? Meditate on how God has touched you attend to him in prayer that you might have the courage and trust to proclaim the good news in everything you say and in the way you live. You will find it has a calming influence. When I was learning meditation from a young Buddhist priest, a man about half my age, One thing he told me is that meditation doesn't have to take a long time. You can just take a minute or two or three out of your work or out of whatever difficulty you're in. You just step aside from what you're doing to reset your mind. So when you wrap a gift, be present to the reality of the person who is going to receive that gift. What hopes do you have for them? How does God see that person? I think that today we could all use a mental reset. And if we do that, then we can say with the psalmist, when the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dream, then our mouth was filled with laughter. Time with God restores our souls. His presence fills us with dreams and, la and laughter, with the overwhelming joy of his presence. <clears throat> This is not something we do. It's something that God does for us. All we have to do is say yes. 
Being joyful isn't something we can plan for. You don't put it on our calendar, Wednesday, 3 o'clock, I'm going to be joyful. No, you don't do that. You can't do that. <laughs> you know, sometimes I've been overwhelmed with joy in this pulpit preaching because the words I'm saying come back preached to me by the Spirit with a force that I could not possibly muster. And it's all I can do to, to not to break into tears of joy. You can fake laughter, but you can't fake joy. For as the earth brings forth its shoots, Isaiah says, and as a garden causes what is sown in it to spring up, so the Lord will cause righteousness and praise to spring up. So is jo joy sown by the presence of God. Just like the soil surrounds a seed and causes it to grow, so does the love of God surround us. And the yield is joy. In, in his first letter to the Thessalonians, Paul connects these themes. And, and, in, and as you listen to Paul's words, you can feel his joy overflowing, the same way you can in the magnificent poetry of Isaiah. Rejoice always, he says. Pray without ceasing. That is, make prayer a background for your life. Take time whenever you feel the need to be with God. Give thanks in all circumstances. Whatever your circumstances are, give thanks that God is there to share them with you. Rejoicing, praying, giving thanks. These aren't separate things that we do. We don't pray today, give thanks tomorrow, and rejoice when we're through with the shopping. Good mind. <laughs> but these things are all inseparable aspects of feeling the presence of God of being present to God we feel the joy and we pray and we give thanks it is in this way that we find peace the God of peace is the source of our inner peace One thing we really need is a good relationship with life because it's in us and we're in it. But as we look around us, especially now, life seems disjointed and we're prey to specific fears and aimless anxieties that haunt our minds and our souls. I said last week that it's so difficult to be humble because our ego associates humility with humiliation. Well, it's also hard to be trusting, to be faithful. There's so much out there in the world that could harm us. We say to ourselves, how, how am I going to experience peace? You know, I'm the first one to say, well, that can't be right. God's telling me to do this, but no, that's not what he means. Uh, think of all the trouble we can get into here. There's all kinds of difficulties. I've got to be the one in charge. It's difficult to trust God. It's hard to let go. But consider all that Paul endured. There were Jews who opposed him. He had some kind of physical deformity. He was persecuted. There were the shipwrecks, the imprisonments. But despite all this, Paul says, the one who calls you is faithful. He will sanctify us and give us peace. The shoddy commercialism of the season is not designed to give us peace, quite the opposite. It's designed to make us hurried, harried, 
distraught and distracted so that we will spend more money than we should. But this is Advent. We are waiting for the coming of Christ. Even with a mask on, you can take a deep breath, take a moment, spend time with God. And He will restore you. He will restore your spirit and He will give you peace and joy. And you will know that the psalmist spoke the truth. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My whole being shall exult in my God. For he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe.